at this baby. Look at this, it's still got the key in it, look. Look at that. Now you're all thinking exactly what I'm thinking, aren't you? Pull the pin, throw it, and video it. Video it. I'm so tempted to just video this. Pull the pin and throw it as far as I can and get it on video. That would make this video the most exciting video ever. Um, but I can't, can I? I can't. Can I? Can I? No, I can't. There's points where you have to grow up and stop being childish. I'm not very good at finding them points, but this is one of them points where I think I'm going to find it. I can't pull that pin. I've got to leave that pin in. I can't pull it. Well, good morning to you this morning. Again, we're glad that you've joined us here at New Hope on Father's Day. Um, I'm thankful for the father that I had. I trust that you have a father that you're thankful for as well. We all have a father up in heaven that we're thankful for, don't we? Hey, we're in the third week of our series entitled Pull the Pin. And uh, when Rob laid this out before us and has given me the opportunity to be, to be before you this morning... He said, Ned, just think about something that you're passionate about, that you pulled the pin in in your life and it's made a difference, something that you'd love to share with the folks at, at New Hope, um, can challenging them to, to pull the pin in some aspect of their life. And um, the message this morning is entitled, Jesus 101, Basic Truth for Intimacy with Jesus. Pull the pin on intimacy with Jesus Christ. Pull the pin on a deeper relationship with Jesus. Go deeper with him than you'd ever been before. When I think about that, I think about a passage of Scripture, as a matter of fact, a whole book of the Bible, the Gospel of John, that, that I believe guides us into intimacy with Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, I was at a writer's conference north of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, during the conference, during a portion of that, I was walking along beside a well-known Christian author named C. Smurphy. Uh, I found out by looking on the internet, he's offered, authored over 135 books. He was the ghost writer for Franklin Graham's The Rebel Without a Cause. More recently, he has co-authored with uh, Dr. Ben Carson, um, a book that's out there in the arena today. And uh, C. Smurphy asked me, he said, Ned, if you were ever to write a book, what would you write a book about? And I said, I think that I would write a book on pursuing an intimacy with Jesus Christ and base it on the Gospel of John and divide it into two parts. The first part of the Gospel of John, pursue an intimacy with Jesus Christ, and the second part, pursuing a deeper intimacy with Jesus Christ. I believe John epitomized for us someone who had an intimacy with Jesus Christ. We see that several places in in John's gospel, matter of fact, through the entire gospel, but we see it played out in his life in several different ways. John had a confident intimacy with Jesus Christ, and we first see that in what John thought. You know, our thinking 
backs up a lot of what we do. Our thinking causes us to do what we do. And John had a a thought going through his mind as he wrote this gospel. It came up on several occasions, but it comes up at least twice in John chapter 21. First of all, in John chapter 21, verse 7, it says, "...that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord." Down in verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciple who Jesus loved following them, the one who also had reclined or leaned his back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? John was consumed with the thought that Jesus loved him. John refers to himself in this gospel as the disciple that Jesus loved. He was consumed with the love that Jesus Christ had for him. And because he was consumed with the love that Jesus Christ had for him, it brought him into a deeper relationship with Jesus. John wasn't puffing out his chest with pride when he was referring to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, as if he were to say, Jesus loved me more than anyone else. That wasn't what John was doing. John was just utterly consumed with the fact that Jesus loved him. The second thing was already referred to, but we see it more clearly in John chapter 13, but we see John's confident intimacy in Jesus Christ in what he did. You know, when we think things, we do things. And in John chapter 13, verse 23, it says, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. First of all, John was consumed with the, with the love that Jesus had for him, but secondly, it caused him at a very intimate moment in the lives of the disciples just hours before Jesus Christ went to the cross. It caused John to actually recline against Jesus during the Last Supper meal and the fellowship that the disciples were having. Maybe you haven't thought about it this way, but we could say John cuddled up to Jesus. If Jesus were to walk into this gathering space this morning, how many of you would want to put your head on Jesus' shoulder or or tuck yourself up under his arm? Um, I'm telling you, that would take some going, wouldn't it? Wouldn't we probably bow and fall back in awe? And and, and that's appropriate too. But, But John was so confident in his intimacy with Jesus Christ that in that very warm moment, but in that very critical moment, in that decisive moment in the span of all history when Jesus Christ was going to the cross to shed his blood for the sins of mankind, just hours before that, John was drawn so close to Jesus that we could almost say that he cuddled up to Jesus. Finally, John's confident intimacy is seen in in what he wrote. We're going to look at um, John chapter 1 in just a moment. But near the end of our Bibles, we have a little letter that that John wrote. It's called 1 John. And in that passage of Scripture, we see these words that that John wrote. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1. Referring to Christ, he says, That which we... That, excuse me, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched and with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life that was manifest and we have seen it, we testify to it, we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and we heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be made complete. John wrote about the intimacy that he experienced with Jesus Christ. He said, basically, we have seen him with our own eyes. We have heard him with our own ears. We have touched him with our own hands. John didn't go there in this text probably because of the blessed leading of the Holy Spirit, but undoubtedly John could have said, we have smelled Jesus with our own nose. Not that Christ had an odor, but we all have an aroma. (laughs) 
I mean, he reclined against Jesus after a hot day, for heaven's sakes. He experienced Jesus in all of his senses. John was intimate with Jesus Christ. John had pulled the plug, or pulled the pin, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, get the series right, Pastor Ned. John, John had pulled the pin on a relationship with Jesus Christ, on an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to take you back in my life some years, all the way back to 1977, and Colin and Eric are thinking, Pastor Ned, you're taking us back to the olden days. <laughs> the last Saturday of July, 1977, I had driven my car home from church camp, and I had gone to a local market called M&M Market in Dover, and I had bought four steaks. And I had taken them, put them in the refrigerator at the home, and that was after I had opened the garage door. I lived with my parents. We had a a two-stall garage, and they had an opener on their side, but I had to use a key and unlock my side and manually lift up the door. A young lady named Mona had made me a keychain. It was a clear plastic. It had the letters N-E-L-S-O-N on it. You don't know my real name was Nelson. It had a little heart on it, and there was a key on that keychain that Mona had made for me. I took that keychain. I opened the door, gone in, laid my, my steaks in the refrigerator, pulled out the hose, began washing my car. My sister, older sister, six years older than me, she drove up. My parents weren't at home at the time, and my sister uh, lived nearby. Apparently, mom and dad had had arranged for her to come by and water plants or something. I'm not exactly sure, but noticing that, that I was home from church camp and I was watching my car, my sister said, do you have a date with Mona tonight? Well, I said, I do. I said, uh going to take some steaks over to Roger and Gwen's house, a co-worker of mine married, and we're going to cook them out and spend the evening together. And, and I was looking up at her as I was washing the car and chitting, chatting about something or other. And she said, Ned, she said, something's different about you. I said, what do you mean, sis? She said, well, you just look different to me. What happened? And I said, sis, I have pulled the pin on the next stage of my life. No, I I didn't really say that. I I said, I've popped the question. And my next older sister, I was her baby brother. She just becomes a chatterbox. She said, oh, Mona's such a nice girl. She's so great with kids. We had had dates where we'd babysitted my sister's kids and stuff. And she's knowing Mona had five sisters. She said, all five of her sisters are going to be in the wedding. And I said, well, it's not Mona. (laughs) And... (laughs) And my sister, you know, she just can't quite get her hand around this thought. (laughs) Let me take you back just seven days before that, the Saturday that church camp began. I was a counselor up on Senior High Hill uh, in the cabin, arranging my stuff, making my bed, welcoming some of my campers in the cabin. And we heard the word from the parking lot and through the trees that the group had arrived from Michigan. And there was a girl from Michigan that I'd been riding back and forth, and we were friends, and, and uh, I ran down the hill and I greeted the Michigan friends, and I ran up on this girl whose name is Missy, who was wearing a diamond. I said, hey, can I talk you into a bigger one? <laughs> and uh, we, had, we had met two years before at a, at a youth event. I uh, remember the day that I met her, but I don't remember ever seeing her again that entire week. The next spring, a group of us went to North Carolina for Easter sunrise service, and we were part of that group. And she probably really doesn't remember me from that weekend because I ran off from our group and was hanging out with my North Carolina friends. But driving home, 
Uh, it was my last, my turn to drive at the very end of the trip, and I was tired, and she agreed to sit beside me and talk to me and keep me awake, and I guess we became friends as I told her imaginary stories about people. <laughs> so there at church camp 1977, we'd written back and forth. She arrived there engaged, and I hinted at things through the week. And finally, about Thursday of that week in the rain, we were standing under the the diving tower at the, at the lake, and um, hinting and saying and talking, she said, well, what are you proposing? A girl that uses a word like that expects you to say something. <laughs> I, I said, marriage. So you're getting the picture. Here's a, a girl I've seen at a few youth events. We've written ourselves some written letters to one another. And I, without even kissing her, I had asked her to marry me. Without even having a quote-unquote date, I'd asked her to marry me. And my sister, kind of, you know, picking up on all this when I was talking to her as I was washing my car, she said, well, what are you going to tell Mona? I said, well, I'm going to suggest to her that since I really don't have an answer from this girl yet because she felt like she needs to break her engagement first... I'm going to suggest that maybe we continue to date until I get an answer. <laughs> and um, prob probably when I made that suggestion to Mona later in the evening, her next three words are the most reasonable words that you've heard so far in this story. She said, take me home. Um, I pulled the pin on establishing a more intimate relationship with somebody on this planet when I invited Missy to marry me. And from that intimacy has come four children, eight grandchildren, because we have pursued a deeper, more intimate relationship. There's a blessing, folks, to pursuing a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a blessing in touching the, the foundation of who Jesus is in a deeper, more honest, um, more passionate way. To pursue being as close to Jesus Christ as you possibly can. John knew about this. John experienced this. And John wrote about this so that you and I can experience it as well. And it's often said that the gospel of John is the universal gospel, that it's uh, an easily understood gospel. And those things are true. The, the copies of the gospel of John, are probably, there's probably more copies of the gospel of John than any other portion of the scripture. They're often passed it out, passed out at evangelistic um, campaigns and, and rallies after people come to know Jesus because this is the starting point. And all that's true and all that's wonderful, but because that's so, don't think that the, just, the gospel of John is simple. It's for those of us which want to go deep with Jesus Christ as well. But interestingly, in this context, John starts off with some very essential truths about Jesus Christ. Basic truth for intimacy with Jesus is what I would call the first four verses of the Gospel of John. I mean, we could talk about John for ages and ages and ages, and I, I trust you'll investigate that uh, through the seasons of your life. Oh, by the way, is, doesn't that remind us that the, the miracle series that we had from the Gospel of John was wonderful too? Weren't we blessed by that? Didn't that help us grow closer to Christ? But John starts out not with a fantastic miracle. John starts out with these words, in the beginning was the word. I'm reading from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, 
and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, anything that we pursue in life, if we pursue it well, is pursued well because we put it on a foundation. And the foundation that I want to present for you this morning for pursuing an intimacy with Jesus Christ is truth that is found in these four verses of Scripture, basically five truths. And every aspect of our life, every challenge that we're going to face, every problem that we're going to look at, every hurdle that is going to be before us, to overcome it, to get through it, and to get through it because of our intimacy with Jesus Christ, there is truth in these first four verses that's going to be essential for that. And the better that we understand and identify with these five truths that I'm going to share with you, I'll do so quickly, I promise, we'll be blessed to know that it'll help us pursue a deeper intimacy with Jesus Christ. The first truth is this, in the beginning, Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. In the beginning was the Word. Whenever the beginning was, the Word was already here. Jesus was here at the beginning. If Jesus Christ was not here at the beginning, he was already here at the beginning. If he was not here already at the beginning in the universe, in time, he would have had himself a beginning. Because Jesus Christ didn't have any beginning, Jesus Christ has no end. Jesus Christ is eternal. Yes, he came to earth and was incarnate in human flesh in the womb of Mary. And yes, he was born, and we celebrate that at a season of time in our calendar. But that wasn't when Jesus began. He was the eternal word of God. Jesus Christ is is eternal. Truth number two, Jesus Christ is God. And it says, and the word was with God and the word was God. Do those first three words of John chapter one, verse one, remind you of anything else in the scriptures in the beginning? It takes us all the way back in our thought to Genesis chapter one, doesn't it? And there in the beginning, God created Interestingly, in the Hebrew language, the word for God is in the plural sense, which means more than one. Why could that be? Because there was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit already in the beginning. And the interesting thing is, is how this Godhead, which is a plural Godhead, acts as one. In the Hebrew language, the noun is plural, but the verb is singular. Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ is God. Truth number three, Jesus made all things. He is the creator of all things. We're all wearing clothes today. Aren't we thankful for that? <laughs> our, our clothes are made of fabric. If you would look, you might see you wearing 100% cotton or 50% cotton. Um, that cotton has come from a plant. It's grown from the ground. We're sitting on chairs that have fabric and steel. All that comes from the ground. Jesus Christ made everything that's in this room. Our entry doors are covered in oak veneer. Those grew from little acorns. Jesus Christ put the life in the acorn. Jesus Christ is creator of all things. 21 years or so ago, my wife and I went to Nepal, and uh, our daughter was about eight years old at the time, and she was struggling with the fact that her parents were going halfway around the world. And, uh, honey, but this will be, you know, my daughter couldn't capsulize how, you know, and we were praying about it, and somehow or another, God led my wife to look at a tag on my daughter's blouse, on her little top. And believe it or not, it said, made in Nepal. God, I don't know whether the fabric grew in Nepal or China or India, 
But God made that, and he allowed it to be fashioned. He allowed that tag to be put on that. He allowed us to, at some point or other, pick that up for my daughter so that in that moment when my daughter needed some reassurance that Nepal wasn't all that far away, look, sweetheart, you're actually wearing something. You have been wearing something without knowing it that was made in Nepal. Are you getting it? God worked that out to comfort a little child's heart. Does that want to draw you into intimacy with Jesus Christ that God is able to orchestrate such a, de- such a minute detail as a tag on a child's blouse? Jesus Christ is creator of all things. Truth number four, Jesus Christ is life. Verse four, in him was life. Jesus Christ said to Thomas, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The message of Jesus Christ is an important one. It's open to all, but the way to heaven is still very narrow. It is only through Jesus Christ. The only way that we can have life spiritual life and the only way that we can have wholeness in that life is through Jesus Christ he knows what's going on in our life he knows the resolution that he wants to bring to the trials to the hurdles to the frustrations and and the stuff that we deal with in life because he is all about life he is all about living things Jesus Christ is about making things well Jesus Christ is about giving wholeness to our life. I am come that you might have life, he says, and have it more abundant or have it to the full or max out in your life, Jesus Christ says. If we want the most of life, we got to pursue depth with Jesus. Truth number five, Jesus Christ is light. Jesus Christ is light. It doesn't take much light at all to throw away darkness, does it? I put my cell phone in my wife's purse earlier this morning, but but oftentimes when I start work at 4 or 5 in the morning and I go into a dark parking lot and open up a, a dark box truck to see what's in there and to make sure that what's in that truck matches the orders that I have for the deliveries that I have to make for that day, I'll take my cell phone out of that pocket, just a very small device. It's a really stupid thing, except that it is a smartphone. And I, I click on the, uh, the, the flashlight feature on that phone, and it, it lights up just a, a tiny little bulb. It's a dark parking lot, a dark morning, a dark truck, and that tiny little bulb will cast away the darkness that's in that box truck so that I can see actually what's in there and begin to match it up with the orders that I have that I need to deliver for that day. I don't care how dark you think your situation is, the light of Jesus Christ can cast it out. The darkness will not overcome the light of Jesus. A couple things as we close this morning. First of all, intimacy with Jesus does not make us perfect, nor does it take away our problems. I mean, if you think, hey, I got issues, I'm gonna put my faith in Jesus, and just like that, everything's gonna be like the sound at the end of the sound, the song at the end of the sound of music and a meadow, and breeze. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But intimacy with Jesus Christ will add meaning and wholeness to our lives. Each one of us, each one, including myself. I, I haven't capitalized on complete intimacy with Jesus Christ. Can I still go grow closer to Jesus Christ? 
Indeed, I can. There, none of us have maxed out on that. I'm, I guarantee you that. I mean, if Billy Graham was here this morning, I might not be so bold about saying that, but um, I, I know that I haven't. And uh, I'm just kind of assuming that none of us have maxed out yet in the depth of the relationship that we can have with Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with two questions this morning. Are there any of us that need to pull the pin on, first of all, a relationship with Jesus? There is only one way to heaven. There's only one way to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's through putting your personal faith in him and recognizing what he has done to pay the penalty for our sin. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, maybe you're getting a clue that that indeed is how things work because you haven't been able to fix stuff yourself. Is there anyone here today, maybe it's you, that has never come to that point in life where you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? I refer to this church camp where I'd ask my wife to marry me seven years before that week at that camp. I was challenged, Ned, do you know that you have a home in heaven? And I put my knees on a cement floor and I put my face in a brown metal folding chair and with a dear lady beside me named Shirley Henry, I ask Jesus Christ into my heart. The second question that I have for us today, are there any of us that need to pull the pin on a deeper relationship with Jesus? Look, we're all somewhere, right? What's the next step in your life in growing closer to Jesus Christ? in enjoying more of his presence in your life. What's the next step? My son has a home for sale in, in Cincinnati, and we're trusting that he can sell it. But let me just draw this picture for you. Uh, a couple goes to the realtor, looks at this home, decides to purchase this home, and they offer, and my son gives them a counter offer, and they come back, and they come to an agreed price, and then my son says, you know, that's going to work out well, but you guys cannot have the master bedroom. <laughs> Do you think that would put a kibosh to the deal? But you know, that's what some of us do with Jesus Christ. Jesus, I'll give you this, I'll give you that, I'll, I'll do this, I'll do that, but I won't do this other thing. Uh, 1978, I was laying in a, on a piece of foam in our spare bedroom. And uh, I was looking at a college catalog uh, for the college that Missy and I were going to attend in Chattanooga and um, learning that one of the things that we had to do was being involved in Christian service. And I was thinking about all the things that, that I might do for Jesus while I was there in college. And the one thing that I determined that I would not do is teach a Bible study in a jail. For six years, I taught in Hamilton County, maximum security, part of the, tennis, the state of Tennessee's state penal system. I taught a Friday night Bible study there for six years. Because God brought me to the point, that which I said I wouldn't do, I said I would do. Is there something that we're holding back on in terms of our relationship with Jesus? Now, it's all a growing thing, right? We, we do this, we grow a little more, we learn a little more, we learn a little more. And that's what the exciting thing is about having a relationship with Jesus because it always gets better, it always gets deeper, it always becomes more blessed. But the moment we say to Christ, I won't do this or I won't do that, we hit a wall. There have been times in my life when I've hit a wall. Have you hit a wall? Have you come up against another pin-pulling moment in your life? Have you hit that wall? Jesus wants you to pull the pin on that next step today. What is it 
for you. Let me pray over you. The band's going to come and, and uh, close out our worship. But right where you're at, if you need to open your heart up for Jesus for the very first time, or as a stuck believer, you need to take the next step, you can do that this morning. Our Father God, we come to your throne of grace. We're so thankful, Lord, for what you've given us in Jesus Christ. We're so thankful, Lord, in who you are. Lord, I am so amazed that you have become flesh through your Son, and you've stepped onto our planet and stepped into our world, and you've even died for us. But then it, utter blows, it utterly blows me away, Lord, when I think that you want to be close to us. Lord, not only do you want us to cuddle up to you, but you want to cuddle up to us. And oftentimes we are doing things to keep you at a distance. Help us, Lord, we pray, to do the things that we need to do to get close to you, to maintain closeness to you. Heavenly Father, we pray these things in your name.